Tonight's message as we consider some of the verses here of chapter 6. In chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 29. And here in the passage of Scripture, I, I titled the message here, The Reality of Ministry. I want to work through uh, Mark chapter 6 tonight, just in these verses, verses 14 through 29. And the emphasis really surrounds the story of John the Baptist. We have insight here to uh, John the Baptist's ministry. Actually, it's, it's beginning and it's ending and all that has transpired in regards to who John the Baptist is. But we also see here the reality of ministry within the context. In chapter 6, we've seen at the start of it, Jesus' ministry and a statement that Jesus made in regards to himself as it pertained to him going and ministering to those who knew him best, his own people. And in verse 4, Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And remember that this is where Jesus, the reality sits in for Jesus' ministry. The ministry set Jesus apart even from those that knew him best. But Jesus still did ministry as much as he could in regards to those that came to him, but not many mighty works were done, not because Jesus had no desire to work among those who didn't want to receive him. It's just because there was a lack of faith, he could do no mighty works there. And so we've seen here that after this Jesus, which is a great, I guess you could say, preparation or reminder to the disciples because he's about to send them out and they're going to realize like Jesus was rejected, they themselves will be rejected, that their message will not always be received well, that they will go through even those closest to them. Like in the village here of Nazareth, they were saying, is this not the carpenter's, you know, this, isn't that is not the carpenter's son? Does not his, you know, his mother, his brothers, his sisters live among us? We know who he is. What they were looking at was Jesus, really, in a sense, his humanity. And they were saying he's too frail, he's too weak. Who, do he, who does he think he is? But this was clear rejection. Now, the good thing about the Gospels is we see that the very same brothers of Jesus who once rejected him ultimately became believers in Jesus and some even paving the way in the New Testament but initially, we see the rejection of Jesus' ministry. So then Jesus sends out the 12 with this now experience. So he kind of warns them a little bit that, you know, there might be a time where they will be rejected themselves. And he talks about not every place will they be received. And he says, in the places that you are received, he says, stay there. Uh, don't go beyond that. Don't look to try to do anything beyond that. Um, you know, just keep it simple. Don't seek a better option. You know, oftentimes that's the mistake we can make. And he says, in whatever place, verse 10, you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you. Now, this would be important for them because they just seen Jesus not received and not heard. And so he says, whoever does not receive you and does not hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust from under your feet as a testimony against them. In other words, he's saying, don't take offense. And I think one of the statements that we made in last week's message was the fact that if they reject you, they reject Jesus. If they hate you, they hate Jesus, so to speak. Jesus talked about this. He says, remember, if they hate you, they hated me first. This is just the reality of what Jesus is saying. These are some of the things you're going to face, right? But we also see, too, that basically Jesus is saying, don't take any offense. Don't take any offense at all. The point that Jesus is making is the reality of ministry is it's not about you. It's about Jesus. This takes the burden. And ultimately, we can say, in a sense, not only do we see the reality of ministry, but we also see the cost of ministry. So 
the disciples went out. They begin to go and proclaim and share the word of God. They begin to do all that Jesus had given them authority to do. In verse 13 of chapter 6, it says, And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So this was great, great success. Okay, This was a time where the disciples learned some things and they proclaimed the gospel and shared the word of God. But here's the reality of ministry. They got a taste, a taste of the glory, as Nacho Libre would say, right? A little bit of the glory, right? So they got a taste of it. Jesus, he sent them out. They're encouraged. They're strengthened. And this is not the last time he'll send them out. But Jesus didn't send them out without the reality. They saw their rabbi first rejected by his own people. Jesus says, hey, listen, the same's going to happen to you. I want you to look really quickly with me. You don't have to turn there, but I want to I want to just read to you at the end of Luke's gospel. What Jesus kind of encourages the disciples with in regards to, you know, the ministry and some of the things that they will be doing. Right. And it says here in chapter uh, 22 in verse 35, Jesus is talking about, you know, um, preparing uh, the disciples for, you know, just uh, their, their trip, a journey here. They're going, making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, um, you know, Jesus then says, and he said to them, when I, sent you out with, when I sent you without money bag and knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? Now, remember, that's what he did. In Mark chapter 6, he told them, don't take anything with you. Go. Go. Trust in the provision of the Lord. He wanted them to constantly be trusting in the Lord, okay? But now, look at later, he's saying to them, when you went out, did you lack anything? Their answer was, no, we lack nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. Now, notice something in chapter six here of Mark's gospel. Jesus sends them out. And, and when he sends them out, he says, listen, go out by two. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. And then he commanded them to take nothing, verse 8 says, for the journey except their money belts, to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. In other words, it was really a challenge for them to trust the Lord in all things, right? To trust God in everything and that God would provide. So now I took you there into Luke chapter 22, and Jesus is reminding them of this time, and he's saying, when I sent you out and you took nothing, did you lack anything? No. He says, but now the time is coming. Take your money bags. What was the difference between Mark chapter 6 and Luke chapter 22? Jesus is talking in Luke 22 concerning his departure. He knows that he's about to be crucified, and listen, he's not going to be with his disciples. Here, he was able to send them out. Now, remember the last time we were here in Mark 6, we talked about how the disciples were able to cast out demons and people being healed, right? This was like a work that they did in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit came upon them and empowered them for the ministry, right? How were they able to be empowered for the ministry this time and the Holy Spirit had not come like in the book of Acts? Well, you know, what's interesting here is that they did not need the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit because Jesus was among them and in their midst. And so Jesus was saying, what you're going to trust in is my command. What you're going to trust in is what I tell you to do. Jesus didn't give them and say, hey, you know what? Just go with my authority and figure it out. Or just because Jesus said go, Jesus said go and just you do your own thing. No, Jesus actually told them to go and he told them how to go and also how to act when they go. And they stayed within that framework. So a part of the fruitfulness of their ministry was the result of 
trusting God because they went, in a sense, empty handed materially, but they went fully loaded spiritually, empty handed materially, fully loaded spiritually. That made all the difference. Then they obeyed. There were two things that they did. They trusted what Jesus sent them out with and they obeyed the directive Jesus gave them. So the end result was that. This was also another learning experience for the disciples. Now, when you get to Luke chapter 22, and Jesus reminds them of this incident. He's saying, listen, when I set you out, did you lack anything? No, but now I want you to take money. Now I want you to go. Then he says this to them, and I want you to sell one of your tunics and buy a sword. Why did Jesus say that? Because Jesus knew that the days would get worse that persecution would come, that they would also have to be vigilant. You know, uh, Christ was not opposed to law enforcement. He's not opposed to uh, military, as some people think, that the kingdom of Christ, because he says, my kingdom is not of this world, and if it were, then I would have, you know, my subjects rise up and fight for me. And people take that to mean that Christians shouldn't be in the military, that we should not be bearing up arms, under the new covenant that Christ is opposed to it. No, we're supposed to be able to defend ourselves and defend our families and, and democracy in this country and all of that. That's all fine. The disciples had to do it just with ministry alone. And basically what Jesus was saying was be very vigilant. Jesus was not saying go and look for violence, but Jesus was reassuring them that now they were going to take steps without him being there. This was a whole nother level of trust. But remember what Jesus has said in John chapter 14, in John 15, and in John 16. Jesus said in John chapter 14, in verse 16 and verse 26, that he would pray to the Father to send another comforter. Why he said that was because in Mark chapter 6, he didn't need to do that. He was with them. But we see here now that this is what he's doing at the close of Luke's gospel. Jesus is sending him out. And ultimately, the spirit then would be given to the church. And what they would do would be reminded by the Holy Spirit. And remember what Jesus said. He said in John 15, he says, he will teach you. He will remind you of the things that I taught you. He's the spirit of truth. And so we see here that the reality of ministry is it's not some fairy land and fairy tale type of world. It's not a, you know, go and compete and it is a competitive type of thing in the sense and who can do more and who does it better. And no, it's about trusting God and obedience to his word. It's about making it about Jesus and not about you. It's about understanding the realities and expecting some things. When you get to chapter 6 and verse 14, here's what I want you to understand. In verses 14 through 16, we need to expect that some will revere you when it comes to that. What do you do when people revere you? Now, notice here, the story then begins to take a turn because it, now goes into a whole story of John the Baptist. What happened to John the Baptist once Jesus came on the scene? Well, what we do know is that there wasn't only, you know, those 12 disciples that later became apostles. There were more. Jesus had more disciples. Um, in Acts chapter, what is it, chapter 2, I believe, where we see the uh, Peter... Chapter 1, verse 15, it says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of, of the disciples, okay, of the disciples, altogether the number of names was about 120. So you might say, oh, okay, so Jesus had more than just the 12. Absolutely. It's only 12 that were called apostles. And these are the ones that Jesus called, but... There was always a multitude of disciples following Jesus. In the upper room, there was 120 up there, you know. Uh, we, we went to the upper room, and uh, trust me, that's pretty fit. 120 people in there is pretty, you know, some of you have been there. You know what I'm talking about. It's pretty, if it is, in fact, the upper room 
which we believe it is, that's a pretty tight-knit place, but that's what it was. But 12 of those 120, and remember in John chapter 6, when Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, how many walked away from him then? These were disciples. These were followers of Christ. 500. So 12 became apostles. The word uh, apostolos means to be sent out. That's what it means. It means to be sent out. They're, they were sent out. They were sent out by Jesus, right? And these were the ones that the Lord used at the birth of the church in the book of Acts. So these disciples, listen to this, they went out to do the work of the ministry and some great things were taking place, man. Great things were happening here. Some amazing things were transpiring. And, you know, one of the things is always the disciples' excitement, right? Their, their excitement about what God, you know, was doing in their midst. And, you know, we see all of these things in, in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus sent out the 70. Um, you know, look at that. You know, when we look at it in Mark, we think, oh, it was only the 12 disciples. It, it, Luke chapter 10 tells us 70 went out. And then in Acts chapter 1, it says there was upwards of 120. Out of that number, as the disciples began to grow, 12 of them became apostles, the 12 apostles that we know that were Jesus' disciples. But look at what happens when they do come back from one of the times that Jesus sends them out and they experience this. They came, and the Bible says in Luke chapter 10 that they returned with joy. It says the 70 returned, verse 17, with joy, saying, the Lord, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us, listen to this, in your name. That is key. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, some people say, oh, this is when Satan must have fell. No, it's not. It's a statement. Rather than Jesus saying, hey, there it is. I just seen him fall. No, it's a statement. In other words, Jesus is saying, because there's been this great victory and this great fruit, the kingdom of darkness is being destroyed. There's now victory over demon, oppression, possession. You know, the sick are being healed. The dead are being raised, right? In other words, he says, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This kind of goes back to what I was saying. We make it about Jesus and not about us. Jesus is saying, hey, listen, you might be excited that you pray and a demon's cast it out and you think like, wow, I got authority over demons. Jesus is like, relax. What you should be more concerned about and rejoicing over and thankful for is that there is power. And it's not you, it's coming from the Lord. You guys know that this is why it's important for you to understand the reality of ministry. In 15 years of pastoring the church, what I've seen here, even with well-meaning people, is that they make ministry about them. They make it about them. There, there's, in some way, there's a desire to draw people to them. They want and desire a following. That should never be the case. Should never be the case. And usually those that do do that, listen to this, never one, have a following because God will not allow it. And two, they're usually the first to bow out when difficult things happen. They're usually the first to give in when times get tough. They never receive correction. And um, the thing you can notice right away is they have the victim mentality and you know i'll tell you what that's not that's not listen when the bible talks about those in ministry paul lays it out to timothy and he says listen they got to be teachable man you got to have a you know what a teachable spirit means that you can be told what you're doing is not right so stop doing it fix it and you got to be able to say yeah okay i won't do that but you try to do that with people and what do they say oh i'm not you you're not right you know, and uh, because they want to be right. And I'll tell you what, that's just the reality of ministry. It happens. 
So, yeah, they might have had great testimony and great witness. Listen to this. And there might have been a great thing taking place here. But at the end of the day, there is the other side to the reality of ministry. So expect that some will revere you. What do you do with it? Well, let's consider here. This is what you're to expect. Now King Herod heard of him, of who? He heard of the fame of Jesus. He heard that, that Jesus was, was doing some great ministry, right? In and, in and throughout the Galilee. And isn't that where uh, Herod was? Herod the Tetrarch, you know? Um, why Mark gives him the title King Herod? He's the only gospel writer that does. And if you study historically, Herod was never called king. And so he was never given that title. It was always the Tetrarch because this is, uh, you know, Herod Agrippa. This is the son of Herod, the Herodian dynasty. And when Herod, King Herod died, um, this area of Judea was divided up into four divisions and given over to his sons. And Herod Antipas was who was in charge of Jerusalem. And this is the same Herod that Jesus had to go before, before he went to the cross, okay? Uh, this is the Herod that uh, Pontius Pilate didn't get along with. As a matter of fact, Herod actually hated Rome, even though Rome put him in charge there, right? They, he hated Rome because he, requ hist historically, uh, historians say that he requested the title to be called king, but he didn't have a kingdom. He was never regarded as king. And remember that these are descendants of Esau. They're Edomites. And so they have some relation to the Jews, but they're just not, you know, uh, from the lineage of, of Jacob, right? So they're Edomites. They're descendants of Esau. We know the story, right, very well. But here's, here's what I think is interesting. So, so Herod has his encounter with John the Baptist. Now, the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 14 in verse 1, at that time Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus. Notice this here. So Jesus is fame. Herod the Tetrarch, Mark calls him king. Some say probably more in a sarcastic way. You know, he never got the title from Rome, but he got it from Mark. So either way. But here's what we see here. He heard of Jesus' fame, for his name had become well known and he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Look at immediately what Herod did. He associated Jesus' fame. He associated Jesus' message. Pay attention to this, guys. Jesus' message. He not only associated Jesus' message, he associated the miraculous works of Jesus Everything that marveled or the other people marveled at, <clears throat> Herod associated with John the Baptist. Why John the Baptist? Look at what happens here. His only conclusion would be that John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Therefore, these powers are at work in him. These powers are at work in him. So this is John the Baptist, right, who was who was born to, to this priest, Zechariah, his mother Elizabeth. We know the story very well, Luke chapter 1. And we know that the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, appeared right to uh, Zechariah, his father. And it was foretold as to what his purpose, his life, his ministry would be. Uh, this is John the Baptist, the one who John himself said, uh, John the Baptist said that he was the one who would prepare the way for none other than Jesus. It's John chapter 1, verse 23. When they asked him, are you the Christ? He says, no, I'm not the Christ. He says, I am the voice. Crying in the wilderness, I am preparing the way. In other words, I am the forerunner. But Christ is coming. I am preparing the way. Then we also see that he himself says in John chapter 3 in verses 30 through 35, he says, he must increase and I must decrease. Now, I think this is really important about John the Baptist's ministry, and it kind of goes along the lines with what we were saying about the realities of ministry. John the Baptist understood his ministry. He understood what purpose he came for. He came to prepare the way for Jesus, not to draw attention to himself. 
And he also understood this about himself as it came to the ministry. Well, he knows that he must decrease. In other words, once the one who he prepares the way for is come, John the Baptist says, it's my time to get out the way. Can I just give you guys a lesson tonight? For all of you that are serving the Lord and will start to serve the Lord in ministry and use your gifts, you need to get out of the way. That's what you need to do. You need to get out of the way and let Jesus be seen. And it's going to be a hard pill for some of you to swallow because you're infatuated with people and you hearing your name coming off their lips. Trust me, Jesus is not pleased with that at all. What he wants is humble service. And what he wants is his name to be exalted and glorified. And this is what we see all throughout the Bible. There's never a point in time where Jesus says it's okay for us to pat ourselves on the back and get some glory. Never is. That's the reality of ministry. Going back to our statement last week, it's about Jesus, not about us, right? But Herod looks at this and he says, the only way this could be possible, because see, Herod didn't know Jesus. What he did know, or who he did know, was who? John the Baptist. But Herod had already killed John the Baptist. And he said the only plausible explanation would be that John the Baptist came back from the dead. That tells you that Herod truly believes something beyond John the Baptist's message. He knew there was something different about John the Baptist. Now look at what else we see. Others said it's Elijah. Others said it's the prophet. Notice the word the before the word prophet. You see that word the? That's the definite article in the original language. He's not talking about any prophet. They just said it could be Elijah, right? The prophet is referring to only one that was spoken about in the scriptures by Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, when Moses said a prophet greater than me will come, and they're saying this could be that prophet. And in fact, it is, right? But notice here that they're all saying, who could this be? The Jews looked to that day, especially when they said, hey, this could be Elijah, because remember in Malachi chapter 3, in verse 1, where we see that the Lord was saying, I'm going to bring someone in your midst, I'm going to raise him up, he's going to be mighty in works, all of these things, and the, now they're waiting for that day, right? The Old Testament closes with these promises, right? And then you have in chapter 4 of Malachi, in verses 5 and 6, the Lord saying that Elijah will come in power. So the last closing of the Testament is that Elijah was going to come. So this is why the Jews are looking and they're thinking this could be Elijah. Others are saying this could be the prophet. Herod is saying this is John the Baptist coming back from the dead. And what we see here, we see that after the disciples had been sent out, all that the Lord had done, all these powerful works, all these things. And notice the word there, powers, in verse 14. It's, it's the Greek word dunamis. It's the same work and power that's attributed to the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Verse 16 says, But when Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded. He's been raised from the dead. Second time he says this. You know what this sounds like to me? It sounds like a guilty confession. It sounds to me that in some way, Herod himself didn't just view John the Baptist as an enemy or a subject in his supposed kingdom, but that he saw something else in John. Look at verse 17. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias. Who is Herodias? She is like the first century Jezebel, man. This is an evil woman. In my notes in the Bible right here, I wrote right here, evil woman. <coughs> Herodias was an evil woman. And, and listen to this. John the Baptist was bound. He was thrown in prison. Now, this is interesting. For what reason? We're going to see here. But look at 
Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11 that John the Baptist was the greatest man who ever lived. Isn't that interesting that Jesus would say that? So how could he be the greatest man that ever lived and Herod, the wannabe king, imprisons him? And then we got this now lady Herodias. I don't, you know, I don't know. She's crazy. But here's what's even worse. His brother Philip's wife. Now this is Herod Philip II. And remember, Aristobulus would be actually a brother to them. So that is Herodias' father. So this would actually make her their niece. She marries her uncle, Herod Philip, then divorces him and marries her other uncle, Herod Antipas. Isn't that crazy? And so now you have adultery, bigamy, incest, and this is the issue now. But this lady didn't see it that way. Some say history says it. This is what history says, that both uh, Herod and Herodias met in Rome, and either one or the other seduced one. But they purposefully divorced who they were married to so they could marry each other and be with each other. Now, in all of this adultery and sinfulness and bigamy, all of this stuff, guys, listen to this. John the Baptist comes on the scene, and what did Jesus say? He was the greatest man that ever lived. Okay? You think John's going to let them get away with this? So Herodias is like listening who this John the Baptist is, right? Look at verse 18. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Leviticus chapter 18, jot it down, verse 16, Leviticus 18, 16, and Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 21 Herod's life and Herodias' life was contrary to the word of God. And John the Baptist, in good faith and with a conscience that was holy before the Lord God, could not let them get away with living in their sin. They weren't Jews, for one. And secondly, they weren't trying to be Christians and followers of Christ. But they were in charge of that region of the world that they were, in a sense, over Judaism, because that's what Jesus cursed the fig tree for. And the next day it was withered down to its very root. Because that is the picture of Israel. The guy who was over Judea was a man who was an Edomite. And listen, was not only an idolater, he was an adulterer. He was an evil man. He was lustful. He was proud. He was arrogant. He was full of himself. And he didn't see no problem with marrying his niece and also who was his sister-in-law and taking her to be his wife. But when confronted with sin, John the Baptist's message and ministry was a ministry that would honor God and not himself. I mean, in all actuality, think about it. This is where you see his heart in the ministry. It probably wouldn't bother him per se himself because in a sense, hey, they're nothing to me. They're not my relatives. They're not anything to me. So why say anything like most of us? You don't tell people anything, the sin they're living in. But true ministry, like the reality of ministry, when you're so in tune with the Lord God and you're walking in the things of the Lord, yes, that desire for people to live righteously, you're going to call those things out. And it will not sit well with people. Let me tell you, Herodias was like, this guy, we need to shut this guy up. She was livid. She was upset because he was calling their sin out and exposing her for what she really was. So this queen, let's just say Herodias, it says in verse 19, therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. The word here held means that she held a grudge against him. Uh, women don't hold, hold grudges, especially evil women like Herodias, right? But listen to this. What was the problem here? Look at verse 20. I think this is interesting. 
For Herod feared John. See that word there, feared? Phobos in the original language. When you break that word down, it actually means to have a reverence for. Herod actually revered John. When you read in the other Gospels, the account, it says that when John spoke, Herod actually listened. He actually appreciated John the Baptist's ministry. He was convicted by John's rebuke. Herodias was enraged by the rebuke. Herod didn't want to kill John the Baptist, but Herodias did. Expect that some will revere you. Don't let it get to your head. Minister to them like John the Baptist did as best as he could. And we know that Herod here, listen to this, guys, regretted doing what he did to John the Baptist. This guilty confession is a clear indication that he made a decision and he moved on something that was not in his heart to do. John the Baptist spoke against his sin in his life. So when you expect that some will revere you, here's the second thing, accept that your good works, they will honor you. They will honor you. People will see in you that you're a good person. People will see in you that you're ministering. And for some people, listen to this, it will bless them. It will convict them. For other people, they will hate you for it. And you know what? Have you ever met a person that walks so closely with the Lord that when you get around them, you're kind of like, man, you know, they're, just, they're just godly people. That's what was happening with Herod and John the Baptist. He's like, he's just a godly man. As a matter of fact, Herod revered him in this way. And it says, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man. Where do you think that comes from? Conviction. Why? Because John the Baptist's work in Herod's life was rebuke. And guess what it did? That work caused Herod to what? Honor John the Baptist. Realize there's something about this man that's different. And you know what? When we, listen, expect that some will revere us, we need to also accept that our good works will honor what God is doing in our lives. You don't got to... You don't got to tell people you're good. And you don't got to, listen to this, guys. You don't got to tell people you're good, and you don't got to go show people that you're good. And you don't got to tell people that you're going to go do good. And you don't got to go show people that you're going and doing good. You just do what God's called you to do. And if you live a life like John the Baptist, where God said go and he went, listen, you'll be honored in what you do for the Lord. God will exalt you. Isn't that what Peter says? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and in due time, God will what? He will exalt you. Your good works will follow. There'll be fruit. There's fruitfulness, right? Fruitfulness in all this. Look at what else we see here. In verse 20, it says here, Herod feared John, knowing that he was just an unholy man, and he protected him. Wow. He protected him. So listen to this. Second thing we need to consider, expect that some will try to stop you. Expect that some will try to stop you. Herodias definitely wanted to stop him. And with that, accept that your message will drive some to oppose you. In the context of Herod, well, the message caused him to what? Honor John the Baptist, right? <laughs> and he revered him. But what about Herodias? Did she have the same experience with John the Baptist? No, as a matter of fact, she wanted to stop him. And not only that, it says she wanted to kill him, but she couldn't. So accept that your message will drive some to oppose you. It doesn't mean that you got to go and, and Bible thump people and this and that. No, but when you're preaching righteousness and you're preaching the kingdom of God, Listen, demons will cringe at the name of Jesus. I mean, the disciples just in verse 13 were able to cast out demons and anoint many with oil who were sick and healed them. And we just read in Luke chapter 10, when the 70 came back, they're telling Jesus, we've seen all this happen. And Jesus says, I've seen Satan fall from heaven like lightning. The kingdom of darkness is being destroyed by the kingdom of light. And look at what's happening here. 
Some are going to receive it and receive the benefits and the blessings of healing, and others are going to reject it and they're going to oppose it. Here is a perfect example just with the ministry and life of John the Baptist. I want to draw your attention just to this thought. In chapter 6, we see a valuable learning lesson for the disciples when Jesus was rejected. Then Jesus sends them and says, oh, by the way, you're probably going to be rejected. I also see a valuable lesson here that Jesus tells them this is the reality of ministry. It's never going to go the way you want. A ministry is not about us. It's about Jesus. And God uses you. He uses me for his glory. Right? So expect that some will revere you and accept that your good works will honor you. But that's fine. It's what God wants us to do. Right? Expect that some will try to stop you and accept that your message will drive some to oppose you. People are not going to agree with what you say. So this woman wanted him dead, right? Herod tried to protect him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. <laughs> I don't think Herodias ever heard him gladly. I think Herod was scared of Herodias. I don't know. You know what this story reminds me of? In verse 15, it says other things. Others thought it was Elijah. Elijah had the same encounter. This is like history repeating itself. He had the same encounter with Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab was king and Jezebel was queen. Herod is king and Herodias is queen. Jezebel hated John the Baptist. But notice, or excuse me, Elijah and Herodias hates John the Baptist. You know, Ahab understood that, that God sends prophets to speak to the kings. Jezebel did, viewed Elijah as a threat to her false kingdom. So she murdered the prophets of God. Elijah murdered the prophets of Baal. But look at this now. So then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high, offic high officers and chief men of Galilee. And this is not a Jewish feast, okay? Jews did not ever celebrate birthdays. They viewed that as pagan. Those were pagan rituals. They didn't do that. But the, the Herods would. I mean, they're Edomites. They're going to do whatever they want, right? So here's, here's this birthday going on here. They're, they're having this celebration. <coughs> and look at what happens here. Here's an opportunity. And, and because what happens at these birthdays, it's, it, it's, it's a free-for-all. And so they gave this feast for the nobles and these high officers. And then, Here's another thing I just want you guys to understand. None of the religious leaders ever came to John the Baptist's rescue. And isn't that interesting that even in the Gospels, when, um, you know, Jesus asked the religious leaders about John the Baptist, they were afraid to answer back because they said many believed him to be a prophet. Even the religious leaders did. But notice nobody came to his aid. Here's just another point about the reality of ministry. Sometimes you're going to be out there on your own. You're going to be doing it on your own. And you know what? <laughs> you got to be okay with that. You have to be okay with that. The Lord got you. Keep your eyes on him. Then the opportune day came. Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles and the high officers and the chief men of Galilee. And then when Herodias' daughter, Salome, we, we, we see her name, right? Uh, in the other Gospels, this is who she is. Most likely she was around the age, teenage years. According to the customs of the day, she was at, at the age for marriage, but, but she wasn't married. She was a teenager. And um, it's kind of like the scenario that went down in the book of Esther in chapter 1 when the king ordered the queen Vasti to come and dance before his entourage. It's the same thing that's happening here. And so Herodias' daughter, uh, she comes and, um, you know, she comes and does what they would say here, dance. And this is not like an easy word to say. This is a very sexual, very provocative, very sinful type of thing that she's doing here. But notice that it says at an opportune day, an opportune time. Not for Herod, for Herodias. 
So it's safe to say that she actually was saving her daughter to use her for this. It says a lot about this woman, right? And when Herodias' daughter herself came and danced, and it pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. He also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. Now, I just want you to stop right there. Remember, he didn't have a kingdom. It's just a statement. And he's saying, half of what I have, it's yours. Half of this, everything that I'm in charge of and I'm in control of is yours. So she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. This was all set up by her mom. Listen to this. Not only expecting that some will try to stop you and accept, expect and accept, accept that your message will drive some to oppose you. Here's the third thing. Accept that some will try to destroy you. And accept that un, the ungodly will use any means to get you. They'll use ungodly means. They'll use any means to get you. Here's a couple of things to consider about the reality of ministry that, you know, some will try to stop you. And some will try to ultimately destroy you. These are things you have to accept. John the Baptist accepted these as they came. In his own words, he says, he will increase, I will decrease. This is part of John the Baptist's decreasing. He understood very well what he was called to do. He understood the time, if you will, that, that he was to do it. And he knew that his time would end when the one who was he preparing the way for would come. One of the things we can learn from all of this story here is the humility of John the Baptist, the heart of John the Baptist, and that he, that he received all of this. Guys, listen to this. That he received all of this as to, in a sense, really take in that it's it. His time is done. And he accepted it. He received it. You know, and this is the whole picture here. You know, when some people say, you know, well, what did John the Baptist mean when he later asked the disciples, go and ask if, you know, Jesus is the one or should I be waiting for another one? And some say, why would he ask him that if when he's seen him in John chapter one, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He confessed that when he baptized him. Now he's in prison. He's been there for a little bit and he's saying, is this the one or should I be looking for another one? And ultimately, what did Jesus tell him? He says, you go back and you tell him. He didn't say yes or no. He just says, tell him that the dead are being raised, right? He says, go tell them all the wonderful works. And what did they report to John the Baptist? That all the messianic prophecies are being fulfilled. Yes, this is the one. In other words, you might say, well, why did he ask though? You ever wondered that, why he asked? You know, most will preach a message. You know what they'll say? that John the Baptist got discouraged and that we'll get discouraged in ministry. I don't see John the Baptist getting discouraged. Remember in John chapter 1, this is something you guys should just read and pay attention to how the scripture is written. It says that John received revelation. We don't know how. It doesn't say how. It just says that it was said to him, when you see the Spirit come upon, a light upon the one, like in the form of a dove, come upon him, that's the one. So what did John the Baptist see? He saw the spirit. He heard the words. Now he wanted to know, are the works being done? Is this the one or should I wait for another? Jesus didn't say, go back and tell him. Yeah, Jesus said, go back and tell him the works that you've seen. Guess what? Threefold witness now. That's it. I can go. My work is done. Yes, all the messianic prophecies are being fulfilled. There it is there. Now, what if it, what if, what if it wasn't? The story probably would have ended it different. We don't know. God would have got John the Baptist out of jail and he would have continued to prepare the way. But that was the Lord going back to John the Baptist and saying, now whatever comes your way, receive it. Because, you know, in a sense, listen to this. He prepared the way for Jesus to come. He also prepared the way for Jesus' death by his own death. See, nobody ever looks at it that way. And sometimes these are just things that we have to expect and accept in ministry. 
this clearly brings us back to the understanding that, hey, every single one of us in here tonight, I love you guys. God loves you more, but it's not about you. It's about Jesus. So let's make it about him. Let's keep him the center of our lives. It's not about our comfort and our discomfort. It's about Christ. And God will give you all that you need to get through what you got to get through. God will strengthen you to persevere. And listen to this. In our weaknesses, in our sorrows, in our pains, because we're all going to go through it, that doesn't mean we're not going to feel those things. And we shouldn't, you know, give ourselves to those feelings. By all means, do it. But the hope that we have is that God gives us the strength to endure it. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about him. So anything that would be a hindrance to the person who doesn't understand the reality of ministry will be taken out. But the one who understands the reality of ministry knows no matter what I go through, because it's about him, I will always overcome. You know that John the Baptist overcame in death. Why? Because he decreased. That's what it boils down to. And today people will look at this and they'll say, man, I thought God was on your side. I thought God was for you. Listen, guys, John the Baptist being beheaded. That was part of his ministry. That's how God took him home. When you understand the reality of ministry and know that it's not about you, it's about the Lord. And when your time is done, God says it's time for you to come home now. Come and rest. Listen to this, guys. So she asked for his head. Immediately she came in, verse 25, with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry. Yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. He would not listen and honor the words of John the Baptist, but he would honor the words of his oath. Led to his own demise. Immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in prison. And he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it. To her mother. Isn't that interesting that the girl didn't think there was anything weird? She's like, here you go. This is what you wanted. I'm happy I'm able to serve you, mother. I'm happy I'm able to give you what you want. Would that end? No. Just because the messenger is dead, the message is still alive. The violation of God's word, listen to this. John might have lost his head, but they lost their souls to perdition. John might have lost his life, but they lost any means for them to be redeemed because they had no desire to. Who lost more? John, for a moment, lost his head and his life, but now is received up in glory in the presence of the Lord. And they... Theirs was the greatest loss. I want you to understand that when you expect that some will try to destroy you, also accept that the ungodly will use ungodly means to get you. Also accept that the ungodly may get your head on a platter. It might be a part of what is with the ministry. Some are raised for this purpose. Some are raised for this purpose. After John the Baptist, who follows? Jesus. After Jesus, who follows after him? Stephen. Uh -huh. That was the first martyr of the church. And, you know, he wasn't one of the twelve. He wasn't one of the apostles. And every single apostle after that. Persecution. Millions of Christians. When Peter wrote his letter, millions of Christians had already been persecuted. And that was his whole letter, to encourage the church to stand firm and don't give up. That was Paul's letter, I believe, to the Hebrews. I believe he was the author, to encourage them, don't give up. And he's saying, listen, the ministry is not about you, it's about the Lord. 
And if you think for a moment, oh, we lost one. No, we didn't. We gained. We win. Guys, you realize, let, let me put it to you this way. Do you believe Jesus is coming back, yes or no? Okay. Do you know that when we're like, oh, wow, you know, man, they're being persecuted. You know, the statistics for the Middle East in the last couple of years with the persecution is astronomical, right? There was like over a million Christians, right, in the area of Iran, the Middle East, and then all this happened, and now there's less than, than what, 100,000? Right? Where are they at? Well, they fled. And then we think, man, we're losing. So what do we do? You know, and then you got these vigilantes and these Christians and, and guys that are going to praise God for them, but, but it's like we're putting our hope and trust in them. No, it's in the, this is all going according to plan. Do you realize that when they are martyred for their faith, they receive the martyr's crown? And when Christians step into eternity, guess what? That only means that the army that Christ is coming back with is getting bigger and bigger. So not only will the church be raptured up, but all those who died in Christ will also come back. That's what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is all about. So in a sense, it's not a loss on our part. It is a win-win. And Paul even said that alive. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's a win-win. It's not a catch-22 like some Christians think it is. But that is true. You feel like you're condemned and you're damned to hell or, or you've lost if in some way you died or, or whatever. No, listen, you belong to the Lord. The catch-22 doesn't apply to the child of God. It's a win-win. Did John the Baptist lose? No, he won. Some would say, all this evil, man, how awful this young girl was used and she was, she was manipulated and her body was used in a very vulgar and sexual and ungodly way. And then the request, it must have appealed and appeased these men. Listen to this. And they said, give her whatever she wants. But she went to her mother and said, what do I ask for? John the Baptist is in. Ultimately, guys, here's what we need to understand about all of this. The reality of ministry is this. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid him in a tomb. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 14, when Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, that he went to be alone. And that's the reality of ministry. Why did Jesus go and be alone? I'm sure Jesus wept. Remember, they were related. It wasn't just John the Baptist, the one who prepared the way. This was his relative. But even more so, I believe it brought the reality to Jesus himself and his humanity that just like John was taken out, I'm going to be taken out. He not only prepared the way for my coming, he prepared the way for my death. When Jesus, you might think, how did he view Herod? Well, remember, they were like, you know, Herod's after you, he's going to kill you. <laughs> That's the reality of ministry, right? Jesus knew eventually he would die, but Jesus knew that Herod wasn't going to be the one. He says, tell that fox that I'm out here doing what God's called me to do. You might think fox, like, you know, that's like a good term we use. No, a fox is very deceptive and cunning. They destroy things. In other words, he's saying, tell that deceiver and that weirdo that, you know, those are terms that Jesus spoke in. That You guys might think that Jesus didn't talk like that. That's not like a term that you would just say to say. He was actually, in a sense, degrading him, speaking in that way, saying, you know what, he's a wasteful person. He's... Nothing. And in other words, he's saying, you tell him what I'm doing. If he's looking for me, he knows where to find me. Jesus knew exactly that Herod wouldn't be able to do anything. And then when he finally saw Herod face to face, Herod was like, come on, just do one thing. Do something. Jesus just kept. He says, you're not even worthy of my words or breath. And Jesus just stayed quiet the whole time. And then what did Herod say? Well, if you're not going to do anything, get out of here. And then the Bible says that Herod and Pontius Pilate became friends from that day forward. They had one thing in common. We need to get rid of this guy. I'll tell you what, Herod was probably, probably more nervous than anything, realizing here that this guy's different. Pontius Pilate struggled. But the reality of ministry was 
that Jesus came to die. The reality of ministry for John the Baptist was, he's going to increase and I'm going to decrease. And the reality for the apostles, what did Jesus tell Peter? He said to him, listen, you're also going to die. And some are going to have to bear you up, right? Didn't he say that? And it's, he said that concerning the manner in which you... Jesus pretty much told Peter, you're going to be crucified. And history says Peter was upside down, right? Every apostle met the same fate. That's the reality of the ministry. Now, you might be saying, whoa, what does that say about me? Here's what I'll say it says about you. You have to accept that some will revere you. You have to accept that some will try to stop you. And you have to accept that some will try to destroy you. Expect, excuse me. And in all of these things, when you expect that some will revere you and expect that some will try to stop you and expect that some will try to destroy you, you also have to accept that your works will honor you. If you're truly honoring the Lord and you're doing it, listen, and you're trying not to, and any, you know, you're trying to get in and get out, listen, when you do it God's way, they're going to notice it. It's going to do one of two things. Like Herod, it's going to touch his heart. Or like Herodias, you need to get out the way. I need to destroy you. You also need to accept that your message will drive some to oppose you. We need to shut you up. You also need to accept that the ungodly will use ungodly means to get you. And accept that the ungodly will ultimately have your head on a platter. It happens. You might say, is this the end of it all? In a sense, yeah, but that's the reality of ministry. But what happens in the in-between time? God gets the glory. And I think this is a thing that we always do. Now, some people say, you know, will you ever stop doing ministry? I'll never stop doing ministry. There's no way. It's impossible. I can't. And this type of message here, if you were to preach it in places where persecution is high, this would be a very timely message. Right? Right? The reason why these types of messages about ministry, we receive them one of two ways. We say, oh, Pastor Dave, yeah, I see that, but that doesn't really apply to us. Or others will say, yeah, that just sounds too far-fetched. You want to know why? Because we have yet to experience persecution. But it's coming. And when it does, remember the realities of ministry. Remember that your message will cause them to oppose you. Not because you're out there Bible thumping. Because you're speaking the truth and Christ is getting the glory. And when that happens, there's a light on you. Another is going to want to dim that light. But you know that your ministry is in the Lord's hands. And you know, people say that arrogantly. I'm just going to do what God's telling me to do. I don't care. That's not what we're saying here tonight. Do your calling. Let the Lord lead you. How do you know you're doing your calling? You're in humble submission before the Lord. Do it. Let God get the glory. You'll be blessed, trust me.